Hey, what is up, guys? This is an Infinite Flash here. Today I'm going to be talking about what happened in, I believe, Game 7 of the World Championship match between Magnus Carlsen and Vishwanathan Anand. I think this was definitely one of the more tense games of the match so far. We have Carlsen playing white and Anand playing black. Let's see what happened today. We start out with the Roy Lopez Berlin variation and we soon get the main line of the of the Berlin that's well known to be extremely drawish for um, in general for both sides and I guess the first interesting moment is here this is the main line of the queenless middle game variation where white captures on d8 really early if you haven't seen this of course white has some alternatives along the way to try to avoid it I think that um, if I recall correctly instead of uh, hmm, castles here Maybe it was rookie one. Right, right. It was this one. I think white can play this thing, this stuff. Right, right, right. White can play this and get a pretty equal position, but um, lately the the main line with d4 has been pretty much getting all the rage, and this end game has been tried out by a, has been tried out by nearly every player uh, at the top level on the planet. So. We soon get a lot of solo tees and lines like h3 trying to push g4 at some point, not immediately I guess, but um, that's one idea. Knight c3 looks normal. h5 is designed to probably get the rook out at some point when this diagonal is blocked at some point. Um, also designed against this h, this g4 pawn push. Bishop f4 to support the pawn, possibly thinking about you know attacking there on uh, the c7 pawn, but also just mainly supporting the pawn so that you can get your rooks towards the center and develop your knight and maybe try to develop the, the pawns towards the king side. This kind of position is extremely complex. Um, nothing's definitive in this kind of position. This should be 7 looks normal. Rook d1. This should be 6. Knight g5. Yeah, here I guess this is a theoretical position already. Um, both Anand and Carlson are well aware of this position. R obviously you don't play rook move like rook h6 without a without home prep I feel. So g3, rook h6 is mainly designed to capture or you know kind of uh, capture on e6 or you know play rook g6 to get some pressure down the file or you know something of that sort and also allow you know support with that on with the rook supporting that laterally. g3 by white to support that bishop. Um, the idea is that once black captures here, takes here, rook g6, now you can play h4 in full support. I think um, this pawn is really really nicely placed here so there's nothing really bad happening to the white king and after f6 takes takes the idea is that you had the pawn protected here in h4 very very um, kind, of, kind of three move calculation kind of combo so should have four. Sorry about the noise if there's noise guys but um, in this position we saw black capture a pawn here with knight takes h4, but it's not really a big deal. Um, Carlson is soon getting it back, and given the weak black king and weak white pawn, uh, black pawns, he's going to get at least one of the pawns back. And his idea is that after f3, he's going to play king f2 and rook h1 to acquire the pawn back, and black cannot really prevent the cannot really prevent that. So he played rook d8 to try to you know trade off this active rook right here. Hanan did. I think it's a quite a good move. King f2. And rook takes, knight takes. He doesn't want to, he wants to reorganize this knight. This knight could go to e4, but I think there's more of a useful future here on the e3 square where f5 is much better looking than e4, where it, although it attacks a pawn, but it doesn't really do anything much, anything else other than that. Knight f5. Hmm, I wonder why can't white capture the pawn here? Hmm, I wonder. I mean, surely White can capture the pawn, but I think uh, Carlson thinks probably he can get take it anyway, so why not attack this pawn first? So I guess the, there's a lot of logic in there. The rook is not so well placed since it's controlled by that, and Black is not getting the pawn back anyway. Um, so Black decides to capture the pawn over here. It's not getting tracked with a move like b3 because I think uh, Black is actually playing, I think, uh, a move like bishop b1 followed by knight d4 to undermine this point right here. After knight e3 and knight d4, this pawn is very weak. 
Um, probably not that uh, the bishop is hanging here. Hmm. What is the idea, I wonder? Let's see. Bishop takes here, b3. Um, you know, guys, I'm having a brain fart right here. I just, you know, I just realized that after bishop b1, knight e3, black can actually capture the knight here and capture the pawn here. So that's a huge fail on my part. I apologize for that, um, as obvious as that was. So uh, b3 obviously doesn't work, so white captures the pawn. Makes a lot of sense, and black decides to drop back the bishop to support the knight here on the nice f5 squared. White pushes g4, white brings back the knight back, and now white further activates the rook here. White is very slightly better here in this kind of position. I wouldn't say very actually, he's clearly better since this rook is inactive and this rook is really active, and white's minor pieces feel a lot better than black's do. And it's, it's hard to say where Anand went. I'm not really familiar with the Berlin variation in general, but I feel like um, it's pretty much a preparation battle, and I feel like Carlson worked with John Ludwig Hammer a lot in this kind of position. That's my guess, and he's a, he's a world expert on this line, and I feel like he was better prepared than Anand in this line. In this game, I mean, Anand rarely gets out-prepped, so I mean, that's probably the only explanation I can think of of how he uh, really got outplayed because... Um, I guess Carlson just knew it better um, in this in this opening. I mean, not the game. Excuse me. Knight f7 to block the rook's activity, and now knight e3. You can see knight f5 coming, and there's not much black can do. So it was king d8. I mean, just a waiting move. And after knight f5, we realized that you can't actually capture here because both of these pieces right here are attacked by the rook and pawn. So there's no going back after that. And after knight f5, um, black played c5. I mean, this position is really, really uncomfortable here. The idea is that after knight g3, knight e5, uh, after this, um, the, the problem is black doesn't really uh, have a, another good move in this kind of position to kind of gain activity in this position. His knight needs to be active, and this bishop really has no targets. The rook is biting on its own pawn, and... I mean, it's it's extremely difficult to to move in this kind of position if if you're if you're black. So he played knight e5, and um, in the next few moves, I feel like Anand is very fortunate to get a very good position. Actually, not a very good position, but a solid and playable position. After rook here, we saw the rook drop back here, and the bishop capture here on a e5. And after takes, notice that you can't capture the rook over here because white would have the intermediate check to pick up the rook. So you've got to take the bishop, but after this, um, rook h5, black is in very serious trouble. The the net the best the thing about this position is I saw a lot of people commenting it on a, in the chess bomb live server, and clearly the computer does not understand this position. Um, there were a lot of um, lower rated players relatively um, that didn't understand the position at all. And the the best move that the computer gave was rook f8, but it gives an obviously uh, lost line with rook e f8, king e3. Um, you can't take immediately because of bishop g4. And after bishop d5, you're actually moving the knight to this square, get these trades, rook f4, but you're getting this e5 pawn uh, right away, I think. And I mean, this kind of position is completely winning, I think, for white. These two connected pass pawns are very quick with the king supporting it, and black's pawns are going to take a bit to get rolling, I think. So, I mean, that that line is only given like 0.3 or 0.2 by for white, but I think the eval goes up as you look deeper. So, I mean, a lot of uh, lower-rated players like immediately thought that, oh, why didn't Anand go for this? This was his chance to save the game. Like, no, he was still lost in this position if he did this. I think Anand's um, try is the best practical try in the position, even though it's considered by a blunder or mistake by many players. And I think the next move is just great by Anand. Notice that this pawn is dropping, and you don't really have another move other than Anand's move, which is just really the best move in the position, sacrificing the bishop for these two pawns, which are going to become active soon. So after the captures and rook takes, you may think, why did black sacrifice a piece? But rook takes, and you finally come to the real realization that, oh wait, there's no pawns on this side of the board, right? And now all the play is going to be left over along these files essentially with given that black has the pawns over here and all the pawns are over here on you know this side of the board over here so it's going to become very difficult to win this as white 
uh, since black has the four on two majority. And even though you have an extra piece, you have some good winning chances. Black actually has very interesting drawing chances in this kind of position rather than in that rook end game we just saw in that position after you know white is getting the e5 pawn to push his past pawns to victory essentially so that i think this idea this concept with bishop g4 is just a just a great one <coughs> rook takes g4 rook takes c5 non decides to protect the pawn here on c5 with b6 knight e4 to activate the nine rook h4 and now king e2 by carlson he's got a the next um, phase of the game involves like a long positional like and strategic just struggle, slow maneuvering, I guess. Um, Carlson is going to spend the next the next about 80 moves trying to nitpick against this pawn, this pawn structure and try to make use of this piece against two pawns uh, advantage here. Rook h6. Anand is pretty much finding the setup that he, he would like to have in this kind of position. Carlson plays b3. He's got to find his own setup. And both sides improve their pieces uh, to the maximum. Yeah, notice this uh, regrouping by the knight. Rook e7 to probably just waste some time. It's a, uh, what do you call this? I forget, it's spotting time or something. I forget what it's called. But both players are slowly just making small moves here and there to try to make some progress. And slowly enough, white does make some progress here. And it's really it's, it's really slow progress though I have to say and at first it doesn't it doesn't really look that look like white is making any progress but now we see the first move interesting move of the game is like c4 um, to fix the pawn over here without you know it's, you're just fixing the pawn structure so that's pretty interesting <coughs> a bit committal but I don't think it's bad rook h3 King c2 rook h7 Knight b2. But now I think I found a little bit of white's plan here. Now I can see the knight coming to this square or this square trying to go to c3 and there for knight d5, rook e2, rook e7 to try to trade off rooks and try to play a knight in, uh, in two pawns versus this four pawns end game. Uh, I think that's what white should do in this kind of position. Judging by the, uh, d that's just on the surface what I'm thinking. Um, white really needs to get the rooks off the board. If he gets the rooks off the board, I feel like he could be winning. Um, still though it's not easy hmm I wonder what black's plan is against this this stuff after rook h7 knight c3 rook h5 and knight d5 look here what's the plan against this what's the plan against that like the best that black can do is probably b5 and after rook e7 takes takes king b6 what's the plan isn't this uh, winning for white he might take a little bit of technique, but I think Carlson is missing his opportunity here, I think. Um, I'm not totally convinced that that's winning for white, though. That I'm sure that black has a much tougher defense than I'm, what I'm saying, but I think that's an interesting try for white that he has to consider. And what we saw in the game was rook e2, and after rook g5, knight d1. We kind of saw the same plan, but instead of allowing the knight to come to d5, uh, non first place c6 to prevent the knight from getting to that square. Um, also interesting in this position is that black could play rook to here, and I thought there was a cute concept here uh, behind it all, is that black can, white doesn't actually win a free pawn with taking the pawn in b5, capturing, and white is unable to capture here on b5. The idea is that black has the very brilliant c4 pawn push, and at first you might think, what's so brilliant about it? White can play b4 and get a pass pawn here, but now black can play this pawn push and sacrifice a pawn. And this is only white's only pawn on the board remaining. So if he captures, king c6 is forcing the the loss of one of those two pieces, and rook e5 leads to a drawn endgame. And if the knight moves, king takes e5, and rook against uh, king and rook versus king, knight and rook is a well known draw. So Anand would be drawing there. I mean, white doesn't really have to take there, but I mean, what else are you going to do? <laughs> so it's not very friendly to play this position. So I think. Uh, What's happening now is very fair. Um, so after this, we saw six. We saw pawn c6, and now Carlson has to somehow take make use of this weakened d6 square. So now he plays knight e4, potentially, you know, grabbing onto these two weak squares that have been created by Anand. H5, knight f6. 
Um, one other plan that I thought of might be interesting was rook g2, but I mean, after king b6, rook g5, the normal move. Um, check, king up, check, check. King, the white king has to probably go back here um, to avoid all the perpetuals and bring itself over here if black decides to continue the rook checks, but um, maybe rook h4 to attack the knight first. Um, I don't think you can capture here first because of um, pawn captures here. So white probably has to move the knight to protect this, and the game continues, I think, for a little bit. I'm not sure about the consequences of the position, so that was another interesting alternative, if you're wondering. Um, instead of rook g2, white decided to bring the knight in. Carlson decided to bring the knight in onto f6. This endgame is amazingly complicated. I'm, I'm just going to say that. I'm just going to mention that. Like I'm... I've always found these end games amazingly just so difficult to play for uh, for black. Um, like I, what what Anand is about to do is one of the greatest end game def uh, defensive tasks I've ever seen. Um, honestly, even though he can slip up and he, even though he makes slight inaccuracies here, the way he holds it, not allowing anything for Carlson, one of the best uh, nitpickers in end game history, is one of the best feats in chess I, I can really think of. Hmm. I wonder about rookie five. I wonder what would happen after this. One idea is that maybe, probably not that actually. Maybe, maybe check, right? And if the king goes up, probably another check. And then maybe you can capture here in king b4. Maybe that. Maybe. I feel like white would be. Um, black is maybe able to draw this with maybe the pawn push over here somehow. Hmm. The knight can't move. Maybe this is a draw. Wow, that would be cool if that was a draw. I think that that would be a drawing for... Uh, I don't think rook e5 is possible. So um, Carlson has to drop the rook back here to protect the pawn over here properly. And what happens is after rook check, king here, rook check, king here, rook check, king here, we saw a transformation in the pawn structure with takes. Um, by the way, um, instead of uh, king here, um, after king here, Black could have gone king b4, and this would kind of led to the same structure. Um, but except that after king b4, black would, could actually think about ideas of king c3. So I think that maybe white should play like king d1 and kind of get out, get out of this idea and try to maintain more tension in the position. Maybe this was Carlson's better option, but um, after king c1, rook g1, check here, here, here. Anand finally captured on c4. And I think Anand is pretty much playing the most precise moves here till the end of the game. Takes rook here, forcing the defense of the pawn with knight c5. And after king b5, these, this knight, this, there's a lot of tension in here. Black is ready to push this pawn at, at will. Rook c2, I mean, one idea is that rook takes b3 is already on in this position to capture this rook here uh, since the pawn wouldn't be defending it. So white is forced to move the rook. And now black pushes the pawn. And you know, after um, after this, it's very difficult to see anything that white should do. King f2 to attack the rook, but now rook h3 and rook h2 is on. And I don't know, king g2 is not much better than the game. Maybe after king g2, white just black goes rook e3, and there's not much happening. Um, so after king g, instead of king g2, he probably should play like that's what this is what he played rook c1. And now black activated the king. King e2. C3, attacking both of these, and after knight d3, he pretty much had to give up the pawn. There was no other way to continue the game properly. Takes, takes is pretty much running into king b4, kicking the knight, and taking the pawn. So there's no way for black, uh, for white to avoid the draw, I think, and after this position. So after rook c3, he decided to play the knight check after captures, and now rook a1 to try to play this end game where, okay, it's clearly not as easy as before, but I mean, the rising position is pretty interesting where, you know, white has slight chances to trick black into a lost end game, but it's very difficult to break through king and rook when you have a king, knight, and rook. It's still very difficult to win this position as white. And Carlson certainly tries for a while, but I don't think he ultimately prevails. Anand's uh, defense is very... Um, Sufficient, I think, in the end to to win uh, to draw. Even though he gives up the pawn, he activates his rook to the maximum, and White's pieces are not there to shelter the king here. 
Although the knight does go to c3, but I mean, it's not that great. It's hard to win this as white. There's actually, you cannot force a win, actually. Um, maybe if it was bishop and rook versus rook, it would be a lot harder, but even then, I think uh, Anand would have drawn this. I'm sure uh, Carlson makes a lot of progress here getting the king and the knight into these nice positions, but it, and even though he loses the pawn here, um, rook d1 is pretty much not letting white have anything in this kind of position, and I think um, this position is just really, really open and drawn. There's just not much white can do to try to surround the king. He just moves the king of whenever um, white kind of gets this configuration with the, that kind of stuff going on to try to push back the king whenever the king is about to get pushed up. He gives the right kind of check in, in these kind of situations. So. so I think this is pretty much a drawish position, although not easy to draw if you're the opposing player. If you're black, but Anon does a really good job. It would take me hours to go through every single idea, but Carlson eventually tries to trade off the rooks and Anon accepts the draw. And Carlson just accepts that, you know, Anon just played a great defense this game. I think Anon displayed, played, displayed a very tenacious defense. There were moments where Carlson could have traded rooks, as I've mentioned before. It's very questionable if, um, if, if Anand could have drawn the game. I'm, I'm still not sure if you've got, if you have time um, and you could check this, I'd be very fascinated to see if, let's see if we can go back in this kind of position. You know, at moments like, moments like this, where, where, wherever the knight, the knight d5 stuff was on, like knight a4, this kind of stuff, I think maybe black would have played c6, but I don't know. We would kind of get in a similar position, like this kind of stuff. Um, it's clear that uh, I think I think White should win if he gets the knight to d5 and the rook to e7. Actually, um, this kind of configuration, I think that endgame would win. So after this, um, is it really that clear that if uh, Black wins, does he win with or does he draw with c6? I'm still not 100% sure. This position can be really really solid. So, anyways, guys, I'm thankful that you uh, watched this video. Anon just drew a grip. A tired game. He was just, I can imagine, he was just so tired of the game. So a well-deserved draw for him. And you got to admit, for Carlson, I mean, he didn't make that many mistakes. And it's very difficult to... He made it really difficult for Anand. I mean, he slow, made slow and steady progress. But, I mean, it's... I, I mean, just sometimes chess is unfair that way. You, you play a lot of good moves, but it's still just not turning out that you win the game. So anyways... um. Thanks for watching, guys. Uh, I'll be posting game eight tomorrow once they complete it. Thanks for watching.